Good afternoon, everyone, um, everyone who's with us so far. I'll just give it just a moment or so, just to let a few more people in before we begin. Thank you all who's joined us so far. Just waiting a little while. Okay. Wait, what's going on? Okay, it's 12, so I think we'll begin. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to you all joining us at today's Thoughtful Thursday session. So, my name is Ashley from Irish in Britain. I'll be hosting today's session. Before I hand over to my colleague and our speaker for today, just going to run through a few bits of housekeeping. So, with all these sessions, this session is being recorded. It will be then uploaded onto our website as a learning resource. So all participants, your cameras are off and you're on mute, so you can't be seen or heard. If you would like to make any contributions or have any questions throughout today's session, you can do so. If you look to the bottom of the screen, there's both a chat box and a Q&A box. So if you post any contributions in there, I'll be monitoring that throughout. Um, we will also hold some space throughout the session for questions and answers, so please post anything in there. If there is anyone who's joined us today that doesn't wish to be contacted about any future sessions, you can also let me know in the Q&A box or the chat box, or you can send me an email. Um, I think that's pretty much it for housekeeping, so I'm now going to hand over to Zibi. Zibi is our Quivna coordinator, and she will say a few words and introduce our speaker for today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ashling, and a warm welcome to everybody joining our Thoughtful Thursday today. Um, we are organising this um, Thoughtful Thursday as part of the work that we do at Irish in Britain um, under a programme called Quivna, which is an Irish word which means memory. And under our Quivna work, we um, are um, collecting and disseminating resources that can support reminiscence activities um, with people from the Irish community um, and can be used by organisations and also um, by friends, family, carers and um, volunteers um, working with people who may be living with dementia. Um, we um, very much value um, the, um, the theme of memory and Irish heritage and we're delighted today to be welcoming our guest speaker, Tony Murray. Dr Tony Murray um, has um, um, worked for many, many years with the Irish community, and many of you will know him. And um, he has been um, based for a long time um, at London Met with the um, Irish Archives, developing the materials in the collection of the archive of Irish in Britain. Um, some of you also will know that Tony has for a number of years been leading the um, Irish Writers Summer School, and you will know him in different hats. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Tony, um, who is going to be talking to us about the collections at the Archive of the Irish in Britain, and letting you know how you can make use of those collections and contribute to them as well. So a warm welcome to Tony. So Tony, I'll just ask you to turn on your microphone, please, and then um, hand over to you. Can you hear me now? Perfect, yes we can. Okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, thanks Sivi for the introduction and uh, thanks to Irish in Britain uh, for inviting me to talk today to you all and um, also to Cuevna. Um, Cuevna, as Sivi pointed out, um, being um, an appropriate uh, theme in a way uh, in regards to archives because of course archives are the depository of our memories and um, that's something that happens not just on a personal level but also on a collective level in terms of how our, our community is remembered how our organizations are remembered and that's very much the theme i think of what i'm going to say today uh, and how the community can become more involved in what the archive does so welcome all of you um i'm going to uh, begin by just um explaining why i used this title 37 years of growing apart from the fact that the archive has been in existence for 37 years some of you may recognize um the phrase 37 years of growing from uh, a book which was produced some years ago called 
20 years ago by Morris O'Sullivan. Morris lived on the Blasket Islands and wrote about his life in the very early 20th century. Uh, and the book ends with, on the quite a sad note, because it's about how all of his uh, peers um, in his small community on the Blaskets left the island and um, emigrated, essentially, uh, for work. Many went to the States. In fact, the majority at that time went to the States, but some did come over to Britain. Um, so migration is really the centre of what the archive is about. It's about recording that history at the centre of Irish life. But it's not a topic that was necessarily always central to Irish scholarship uh, and Irish academic work. It was only relatively recently that that started to become the case in Ireland. Um, when the archive was uh, first set up in the early 1980s, there was really only a couple of scholars in Ireland looking at the topic of migration. And one of those was uh, a man called Liam Ryan. Uh, I've put up a quotation from a book that he wrote um, in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, I like this quotation because it sums something up about the centrality of migration in Irish society. So I'll just give you a moment to read that. So as he says, emigration is a mirror in which the Irish nation can always see its true face. And in a sense, I think of the archive as like a mirror, or you could almost say like a mirrored ball with multiple aspects to it, reflecting back the story of emigration to um, all users and visitors to the archive. So the campaign um, for recognition of migration in Irish research um, took place in Ireland, I guess, but it also is very much something that um, came from the diaspora itself. So at the time the archive at London Met started, um, another archive in America started, a very similar archive at New York University. And like the one at London Met, it was based on the, um, the documents which the community gathered the Irish community in New York. Um, both archives are now very widely recognized and um, like the uh, archive in America, the archive here has a dual purpose really. It's both an academic archive, um, but it's also very much a community archive. So it's something which um, was set up by the community in the early 1980s um, and um, I just want to say a little bit about that just to contextualize it for you, where it actually came from, what it was originally. It was set up by the um, Irish and Britain History Group, who um, were a small organization established in 1980, well, in the early 80s, and then the archive was set up in about 1984 in Kilburn. And they used to run meetings, seminars about Irish migration, the history of the Irish in Britain, and what happened was a number of people who were visiting the, or attending those meetings brought documents and memorabilia along uh, for to generate discussion, a bit like a reminiscence session almost. And those documents started to be collected by the group. And before they knew it, they had the kernel of what became the archive. It was, a, if you like, a, a kind of core um, collection of mainly documents, but also um, some ephemera. Um, and that collection um, grew steadily uh, during the rest of that decade. Um, the group managed to secure some funding from the Greater London Council and they um, employed a dedicated worker. Uh, here's a picture of some of the people who are involved with the group on the far right is Maureen Hartigan, who was the, um, the person who um, was appointed and she looked after the archive in its very early days and also she ran many of the oral history projects that the archive conducted. Um, oral history was a very important aspect because that story 
of migration hadn't really been told in the early 80s uh, in any wide sense. Many people who were in, actually interviewed at that time had memories going right back to the early 20th century. And we still have those recordings in the archive. They're a great resource. And those stories aren't always available in books um, or even on the internet. Um, oral history for that generation who came over in the 1920s, sorry, in the, in the 20th century, uh, is really crucial because it's a little bit about a gap in the, in the history. It's not always recorded in the, the official documentation. So those recordings are really valuable. In 1986, you might know that the GLC uh, was abolished and um, as a consequence, the Irish and Britain History Group lost its funding. So they began looking for an alternative home for the archive. Now, Mary Hickman, who's second from the left in this picture, uh, you'll, you'll, many of you will know Mary. She set up the Irish Study Centre at London Met. Um, she negotiated space at the then, what it was called then, the Polytechnic in North London, um, which was in Kentish Town. And that's where the archive moved to in 1989. Um, it was a good location because all the students doing Irish studies were there, uh, including myself. Um, I, in fact, used that archive for one of my projects when I was a student in the 80s. And um, after I finished my degrees, a couple of years afterwards, I, I actually came back to the university and ended up working with the archive. So I, my job was by the mid 90s to start to develop it in terms of access, in terms of um, acquisition of new documents and collections. And one of the first things that I did was I, um, I ran a, 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 a kind of um, touring exhibition of the archive up and down the country. And um, it was called When Did You Come Over? The Story of Irish Migration to Britain. This is the poster from the Birmingham exhibition. Uh, that was in 2001. And uh, we went to Manchester, Leeds, um, elsewhere in the country, and we did exhibitions. And what that did was really opened up the archive to um, the Irish community outside of London. And uh, it was very educational for me because I started to meet people in Irish community organisations outside of London and realised that their experiences were quite different in many ways from what was happening in London. Um, there was a distinct regional difference. And I realized that that needed to be reflected in the archive. And uh, that, um, that regional dimension, geographical reach of the archive, I think has, has broadened somewhat over the years. Um, the other thing we did was um, shortly after a film, we made a film with um, a former well, a colleague of mine, a uh, film producer called David Kelly. And that film was called, I only came over for a couple of years, um, which was a quotation from one of the um, interviewees on the film who said, I only came over for a couple of years and I'm still here, um, which is a familiar experience for many Irish migrants, I think. Uh, that was um, a valuable oral history exercise, but it was also, because it was on film, People really rose to the occasion. It's a lovely film to watch, and it's on the um, the archives homepage if you want to if you want to see that. Um, we did a lot of outreach work at the time, um, which helped uh, grow the collections. One of the, in fact, I think it's second biggest collection in the archive is the London Irish Centre's collection. Um, that's the Irish Centre in Camden. Uh, that's a really extensive collection going right back to the birth of the centre and even before. It's actually got documents about the discussions that took place with uh, the Catholic Church in Ireland about establishing an Irish centre in London, the pros and cons. So it's a very interesting collection. And the other big collection is the Irish County Associations collection. Uh, which was a project we ran in the early 2000s. And uh, that was a very successful project because uh, 
at the outset we had i think three counties represented in the archive and by the end of it we had 22 so that wasn't you know that was um and that's something that's continued to grow as time's gone on so the the archive um you may or may not know archives are made up of essentially or primary source materials um but um, that means um, documents which are unique in themselves. There's no um, copies of them. So a manuscript such as um, is on the screen here, for instance, um, that's an example of a primary source. It's a manuscript poem written by a woman called Winifred Patton, who came to London in the 1890s and published quite widely in the newspaper um in journals in in ireland at that time and we have her manuscript collection um also minutes from um meetings by irish organizations down the years we've got many many minutes in the county collections going back to the early 1950s so that's a massive resource for anybody who wants to look at the experience of the Irish who came to Britain just after the war. Um, also letters. Um, here's a TypeScript letter for this is from a collection um, called the um, the um, Anti-Partition League of Great Britain. And that was set up just before the Second World War. Um, and we have an awful lot of correspondence um, from that organisation. Again, a discreet but very interesting historical moment for the Irish in Britain. Another example of primary source materials is uh, photographs, and there's many of them, uh, large numbers in all the different collections. Uh, this is a picture of um, a group of uh, singers from the Gaelic League choir in the 1960s who went to Dublin for the Octus and uh, they took photographs of the visit um, and that collection was donated to us uh, about 15 years ago. It's a, it's a lovely collection. Um, now, secondary sources uh, would constitute publications, you know, things that have been duplicated in multiple numbers. So annual reports, for instance, by Irish organisations, we have many of those. Uh, we have lots of publicity material from groups up and down the country over the years, dating right back to the early 20th century. And then uh, books, of course, um, and academic articles. Um, we also have um, a large collection. We have, in fact, the bound collections. You can see here on the, in the picture, the green bound collection is the uh, back copies of the Irish Post newspaper going right back to the very first issue in 1970. So that in itself is, uh, if you like, a, an archive of the Irish in Britain. Um, and academic articles, as I said. Um, the majority of the collections date from around about the mid 20th century, because that's when the archive was founded. In the, in the 1980s, there was a wave of Irish migrants who came to Britain and that, um, that initiative with the archive was really a consequence of that moment in um, Irish migration. Um, but the archive has grown both forwards and backwards since. So we've acquired many collections going back to the 19th century now. And obviously since the 1980s, we continue to collect. The oldest collection we actually have at the moment is um, the personal papers of Richard Ash Ling, sorry, it should be King. Um, Richard Ash King, um, some of I, you know, it's, it's probably not a very well known person these days. Um, but the papers date from the 1870s. Uh, Ash was um, actually born in County Clare and became an Anglican vicar at St. Mark's Church in Bradford, before he moved to London and helped to found the Irish Literary Society along with WB Yeats. Um, we acquired the collection thanks to um, the Irish in Britain, actually, um, Irish in Britain organisation, and in particular, Anne Gould, who um, helped rescue that collection during a clear up of the officers uh, a few years ago. So we're grateful 
to um, Anne. And in, in a way, that's the sort of um, it's the keynote to what I'm saying in a way is that there's collections dotted around. When organizations move or close down, we often move in and, you know, acquire the collections for the archive if, if we can. Um, so um, as I said at the end, that's, you know, that's something which we would encourage if you can to contact us if there's materials that you know, you know, an organization is no longer going to need um, or you're aware of something that might just be left or dumped even, um, do please let us know. Um, visitors who've come to the archive, I suppose one of the most famous would be the president, Michael D. Higgins, who joined us in 2016. And um, he paid tribute to the archive on Irish TV and, you know, the collection, which was fantastic recognition. But writers such as Tim Pat Coogan, for instance, whose book on Irish migration some years ago was um, really based on archival sources from all over the world, including the archive of the Irish in Britain. I remember working with Tim on that, and that was really a, a great experience. But also we have many TV producers and researchers who come in nowadays because um, many TV programs, radio programs, such like films are made about the story of Irish migration in a way which never used to happen before. Uh, here was one of the first ones um, from about 2000, the Irish Empire. I don't know if many people remember that now, but it was quite an extensive five part series. And um, again, the researchers for that program had to use the archive, you know, to make that program. This is the present location of the archive, um, which moved from Holloway Road um, in 2017. Um, it moved to the university's campus in Allgate in East London um, and it was incorporated into the university's special collections. So um, it was quite an, a key change for the history of the archive. Um, in, if I'm honest, uh, when I was told about it, I was personally reticent because I, 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 I didn't like the idea it was moving from Holloway because I always thought Holloway seems to be the home of the archive. It's very much a location we associate with the Irish in Britain. But um, the pros very much outweighed the cons of moving. Um, one of the biggest advantages was that the archive went to a purpose-built building which was dedicated to our other archive collections. So there was space there for new acquisitions. We had run out of space at Holloway. There was also professional cataloging staff on hand. And there was also a dedicated reading room uh, for visitors, um, something which we uh, only dreamed of in Holloway. We could only accommodate one person at a time. But as you can see, we could have a whole group of people coming to look at the archive um, after the move. And we've done that on a number of occasions. Um, I should say that at this point, um, the archive, because it's part of special collections, is um, one of a number of collections in that, um, in that building. Uh, the biggest collection, in fact, housed there is the TUC collection. And there's a lot of crossover between the TUC collection and the Irish and Britain collection because the TUC collection goes back to the 19th century. And there's a lot of documentation there about Irish trade union activity in Britain. So um, I always say to people when they come to the archive, if they have time and they're doing something historical, do check out the TUC collection as well. In 2018, uh, we um, we received the grant from the Emigrant Support Fund to digitize um, a large proportion of the archive. Why did we decide to digitize? Well, two reasons. One, um, to better preserve the documents. Obviously, in um, you know, if there was um, something as terrible as a fire, for instance, documents got burnt, then at least with digitization, we would have digital copies and we could even recreate our copies from those if we needed to. Um, but also, and probably more importantly, dissemination. Digitization allows us to put documents online. 
Um, so everything I've shown you here today is from a digitized document in the archive. So I'm able to show you something which um, you wouldn't normally be able to see. Um, the contents of the archive are now available through the archives websites. And um, you can see that picture there in the middle is uh, still from the film I mentioned earlier, which you can watch on the home page. But at the bottom of the screen, there's uh, details about how to access the various collections. Um, this also makes the archive more geographically accessible. Uh, you know, uh, understandably, the majority of visitors in person would be from London and South East. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the um, website allows people from the whole of Britain to come and indeed from further afield. We've had visitors from Australia, we've had visitors from um, America. Um, it also means that people with impaired mobility can access the documentations as well, which I think is very important. Um, the digitization project allowed us also to catalog for the first time large sections of the collections. Um, and since the project finished formally, the university's special collections have continued to digitize much of the content in the archive. Um, we had the, the official launch, if you like, of the archive um, in uh, the digitized archive, I should say, in March 2020. Um, you may recognize Steve McGann uh, from um, Call the Midwife. Um, he, uh, he's a great advocate of archives and of course he has Irish background himself. So um, it was great to have Stephen there on the night along with the Irish ambassador. Um, but um, I mentioned this also because of the date, um, 9th of March, 2020. What happened a couple of weeks after that? Uh, I need, need not tell you, um, but what I can tell you is that um, that event was the last event that the Irish um, Embassy was involved with for over a year in Britain. So um, it was a turning point in a number of ways for all of us, obviously, but for the archive, um, it meant that um, it was closed to the public for the next 18 months and uh, users um, weren't able to see documents um, in the flesh, but the digitization project, it turned out, had been very timely because it meant that far more documents than hitherto would have been the case were now available online for people to see as a substitute. The other thing that happened was that we created a number of transcripts from the documents. Um, many of the documents wouldn't necessarily be that legible, uh, some were in, um, you know, old script. Um, and um, you can now access, as well as the original digitized documents, transcripts such as this alongside many of those collections. Now, the good news is the archive is open again and it's open to the public on um, Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 till 5 initially and we're hoping to open uh, more days a week um, as we go. Um, and um, the archive is there for everyone. It's not just there for historians or academics, it's there for everybody in the Irish community to come. You just need to contact us um, at the moment by email uh, through that email address at the bottom there, special collections at London Met, and we will arrange a mutually convenient time. So um, obviously, um, you know, um, that's something which um, you know, you'll need to do by email at the moment. It's not ideal, but it's it's the it's um it's the the best way to do it at the moment. Um, there's a website address there also, so you can uh, see the other collections in the archive. The TUC Library has um, a large digital collection also available to see online. Um, the archive, I would say, just to sum up, is um absolutely 
more representable than it used to be when I first joined it. But it's still, I think, not as representative as it might be in terms of covering all the different activities of the Irish in Britain over the last century or so. There's many organisations, community organisations that don't, that are not represented uh, and we would encourage any of those organisations who have collections they'd like to see deposited to just get in touch with us, even if it's just copies of documents they already have. It's good to have something on everyone. Um, gaps such as the GAA, for instance, we, we have very little on. And we'd like to reach out to some of the organisations elsewhere in Britain uh, too. So do think about that. Um, if you know an organisation, uh, do let us know. And also, um, if you have personal collections, don't underestimate your own um, memorabilia, if you like, or your own personal papers that you've collected related to the experience of the Irish in Britain over the years. If it's something you'd like to see included in the archive, then do let, let us know. So um, I'll, um, I'll leave it there, I think, and uh, give, you, give you some time for, for questions. Um, um, so uh, I'll hand back at this point, I think, to Zibby. Um, so I'll stop sharing and should I stop sharing now, Zibi? Yes, please. Thank yeah. you, Kenny. That was okay. brilliant. So, okay, great. Lovely. Now we have um, some time for questions um, where people um, um, are invited to type questions into the chat and box and um, we can put these to Tony. Um, we also have um, some panellists with us. So I want to introduce, first of all, Anne Jervis, who has been volunteering with us at our charity Irish in Britain for several years now um, and um, came on a visit that we organised with um, Irish in Britain to the archive which was obviously pre-pandemic now um, and I know Anne wants to make a comment and share a question with Tony. Welcome Anne. Hi. Hi everyone and um, thanks again Tony. I found your um, slides really interesting um, and as Zibi said, um, I did, as part of my, with my Quivna hat on, um, go to a talk that Tony did um, a couple of years ago um, about the archive. And um, I actually asked Tony uh, why he had chosen some uh, selected um, photographs and, and information, and why he'd laid these out for us to look at. It was just a sample. And um, he said that they were of particular interest to him. Um, I was also with my daughter and her son and, uh, and we walked around and um, there was a photograph of my dad with his hurling team, um, which was just amazing and um, very, very, very emotional. Um, so it really made everything real to think that what he had done was of particular interest um, to the historians and um, what Tony had thought would be of interest to other people, the, the photograph told a hundred different types of stories, depending on how you, what, what you wanted to look at. Um, but for me then, um, I now have the, the photograph at home and it brings my dad alive and people will ask all sorts of questions. What's hurling? What did he do? Why was he doing it? How long did he do it? Where did they meet? And um, I, I just think it was such a, a great experience for me. And I think I just encourage people um, to go to the archive and bring these people alive again, bring them back to your home, start the conversation, realize um, how important different parts of their life were. And it brought back such memories for, for me. I suppose my question to Tony is, um, it would be, it would have been, great if in my parents' lifetime that they could have known about the photograph. And I suppose, how, how can you get that information out to the ordinary person, um, the ordinary Irish person, um, so that they can then share it and share it? Um, mm. I just think that was, um, that's what came to me. I would never have known about it unless I had gone that day um, to, the uh, the talk at the London Met. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, Sam, for your question. And um, 
Thanks for reminding me of that wonderful moment. It mm. was uh, a piece of pure magic and it really brought the archive alive because as you say, it kind of brought the personal dimension directly into the room and that direct connection that all of us have with yeah. a collection such as this, you know, there's, um, and the photograph itself was uh, part of a collection um, by a photographer called Joanne O'Brien, who worked in the 1980s, photographing the Irish in Britain for various publications. And it went out, I think, as part of a, an exhibition, actually, that was uh, touring in the 1980s. Um, so that's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's uh, the provenance of the picture um and uh it is it is quite a magical kind of um picture in a way because it's a it it captures something which we see every week of our lives you know people playing gaelic sports around london but um it uh somehow you know had never been done before um there's there's very very few pictures of of, of those you know activities um i suppose the thing about archives is you know, um, we don't always recognize the importance of uh, you know, the historical nature of what we're doing when we're doing it. You know, it might seem quite mundane to us at the time, but when we reflect on it later, we realize, oh, that captures a kind of moment of history for our community. So that's, um, that's what archives are about. It's not just about, you know, dry, dusty documents uh, tucked away at the end of a corridor, you know, in, um, it's about um, real people and real people's stories and memories. Um, so thanks for your question. Okay. Yes, it was it was a great moment and um, yeah, very emotional as well. But great, great that you had done that. Thank you. I want to come, thank you, Anne. I want to come straight in after that question and ask you, Tony, how do you encourage people to recognise the potential interest of um, photographs that they may have of themselves or of their family or of activities that they've been involved with um, mm -hmm. for the future because of course um, the archive is something that is being built for future generations as well isn't it sometimes we, mm -hmm. we go about around our daily activities and think these are, are not particularly of interest to anybody and yet you know in time yes. uh, people will look back and wish that they had more more information, imageries, yeah. memories of that. How do, how do we encourage people to recognise the value of the things that they make? It's a very good question, Sibia. Maybe we, we spend less time recognising that importance today with photographs than ever before, because it's so easy to take a photograph now, isn't it, on a, on a phone? And then we've forgotten we've taken a photo almost immediately afterwards. I don't know that we maybe go back and look at photographs as much as we used to. Uh, maybe we take lots more, but look at a lot less. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, you know, when we used to get out an album of photographs and go through them, you know, just for uh, an evening and just to sort of remind ourselves of things that happened from the past. And um, maybe something like that needs to happen online. Maybe we need to do more of that. Maybe we need to actually start uh, looking again at, uh, you know, photographs we've taken um, rather than simply continuing to, comp you know, continually accumulate more and more. Thanks, um, Tony. Okay. Just have a question here if I might come in. Two questions, actually. Um, firstly, um, somebody's asked if you ever acquire any materials from any other archives relevant to the Irish in Britain. Um, perhaps those sitting uncatalogued. Um, someone has said that they know that LSE has, a, has some personal papers, but they're hard to access. So they were wondering mm -hmm. if you ever acquire materials. Yeah, um, generally speaking, um, we, uh, as a principle, we tend to um, favour archives which are already established elsewhere to remain where they are for provenance reasons. It might be geographical reasons, say, for instance, in Manchester, there's uh, an Irish traditional music archive. Now, there wouldn't be much point in moving that down to London into the archive of the Irish in Britain. I think it's best kept in the location where it was created. Um, 
I think this is where digitization comes in because the next step with digitization is to link up all the digitized collections into a network so that people from London can then be more aware of, you know, collections in places yeah. like Manchester, in places like Leeds. And I think that there's, uh, there's a job of work there. Uh, and I think that's uh, something that we all need to think about uh, mm -hmm. going forward is how do we organize all those links? Um, because we can do both. We can have an archive physically located uh, in one geographical location. Uh, and at the same time, we can have a digital interconnection through the network for everyone to, to see. Absolutely. Um, just have another one here, Tony. Just um, somebody's asked if, if there are any favorites you have in the oral history collection. In the oral history, I think that film, uh, which is right on the front of the website, I never tire of watching that. Um, we made it, I think, probably about 15 years ago. Sadly, many of those people have died since, uh, which adds an added poignancy, maybe. Um, but I find this, every time I show that film to a group, um, it's, it's an amazing pump primer for conversations and memories that people have about their own experiences. Uh, and that's, um, uh, I think, there's something about the way they tell their stories. It might be a cliche to say the Irish are great storytellers, mm -hmm. but um, my God, that film is incredible. They really rose to <laughs> the moment. And there's some great humour in there, as well as some really, you know, quite poignant stories. So uh, I really, um, I really encourage you to watch it if you haven't already. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. I want to welcome in now Dr. Mary Kilkey um, into the panel discussion. Mary, um, many of you will know, has been um, involved with Irish and Britain work for many, many years and is the patron of our Quiffner programme. Um, so Mary, I just invite you to turn your, your camera on and to, um, to put your comment to Penny. I can't turn my camera on. It's not letting me turn my camera on. We can hear you, so um, please. All right, OK. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to show something. I wanted to ask Tony about our life story book. We've developed a life story book, which is intended to help families help their relative with um, dementia to, to reminisce. Um, and we're, we're encouraging family carers and, and indeed our organisations to actually use the use this to trigger people's memories and to record them where possible before it's too late and now this is going to be very much an individual kind of family memoir memorabilia for for a family but do you see any role for that in the archive if 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 and when we get sufficient numbers of those oh absolutely uh, on principle we're always open to um you know, um, including oral history, because as I said, you know, that, that was very much part of the archive at the outset. And it continues to be, there's still just not enough of it done. There's so many stories out there. Um, uh, I should say at this point, Peter Fisher, who is the uh, special collections manager is with us today. And um, Peter, um, will probably be the person to liaise with about any deposit, if you like, of new materials for the archive. But oral history is always very welcome. And the great thing about oral history is because it's usually recorded in a digitized form now, it doesn't take up a great deal of space. It's something mm. which is it's born digital. So it can be included very quickly and easily. Uh, so yes, so definitely encourage you to speak to Peter about that or myself um, would be very happy to discuss it. Yeah, could we need to encourage our community to use it, but I think in time yeah. it's got the potential to be a great resource. Yeah, um, or failing actual physical deposit, there's always, you know, the prospect of the links, which I mentioned earlier, you know, ensuring mm. that we're aware so that we can build a mutual link online. Um, I think um, the there was a there was an oral history project conducted by the Irish in Britain about seven or eight years ago, which uh, I was involved with with Fiona. Yeah. 
And yeah. um, that's a really rich resource as well. Um, mm. But that's something we don't actually have a link to. I know it's deposited elsewhere. It's not deposited with us physically. But that doesn't matter in a way. If, there's a, if a link is made, then at least people who come to the archive website will be then aware that that collection also exists. Um, oh, that's useful. We looked that up. Thanks, Tony. That's all. Thank you, Mary and Tony. And of course, Tony has highlighted the um, possibility not only of individuals to consider making donations to the archive, but also organisations. So I know, for example, the, the book Mary's referring to, I can show it here as well better, the um, book that Mary's referring to is one of various um, books and pamphlets and pieces of information that Tony's kindly taken into the archive already um, from Irish in Britain as an organisation. In other words, a, a blank book that hasn't been filled in, but it um, contributes to the record of Irish organisations, uh, Irish charities, um, activities, um, and it helps to document for the future what, what different charities are doing. And I know that, you, um, that, that contributions from organisations, leaflets, posters, flyers, which are often um, recycled perhaps rather than passed on, are actually, actually very much welcomed. I want, we have some more questions, but I want to at this stage um, invite um, Peter Fisher to um, come in and make a comment. Peter, um, we welcome you from London Met. Peter is the Special Collections Manager at London Met, of which the Archive of the Irish in Britain is one. And Tenny has also mentioned the, the very large collection of the, the trade unions, the TUC. Um, Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. I'm, well, Peter Fisher, the Special Collections Manager at London Met. Um, broadcasting from home, because we work at home on Thursdays. This is our nod to hybridised working in this dreadful Covid time. I'm not actually based in Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, as you might suspect, but actually in Ballum. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, reiterate that we are now open, albeit on a slightly limited basis at the moment. The university has taken quite a cautious approach, and rightly so, I think, to the whole nightmare of Covid. Um, we're open, as the previous slide has shown, on Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, I think probably what I would advise in my role is to really have a, a good look at the website um, of the special collections, of which, of course, AIB is uh, very much an important uh, component. It's the second largest next to the Trades Union Congress Library Collections, which itself is a collection of national significance. Um, have a look at that because there's a lot of information there and I think if you are minded to contact us and hopefully even visit us um, then please get in touch in advance via email. Um, we have a new telephone system being implemented at the moment. I don't suggest you dip your toe into that right now so please contact us by email. Maybe if you're planning to come at a particular time then give us a little bit of advance warning because the material of interest to you will, is held in vaults. They're all environmentally controlled. It's the last word in that technology. Um, and therefore we may need a bit of time to prepare for that. So if you can give us at least a couple of days notice, that would be fantastic. Um, just on a, on a practical note and back to the, the dreaded C word again, COVID, um, and for your information, if you are coming to visit us, it is university policy that all visitors provide evidence of a negative lateral flow COVID test on arrival. Um, and if you can have that done the day before, that saves an awful lot of time and you will then be provided with a little badge and you're then able to access the site. Um, but we very much look forward to welcoming you there. Our reading room is really quite magnificent and you just come and have a look at that for that alone, if you like. Um, and that's, uh, all I have to say, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you. And, and just to reiterate, it's a very warm and welcoming space and it's also very accessible. It's accessible to people with um, disabilities as well. Um, there are more questions coming into the chat, which is great, please keep them coming in. Um, there's um, a couple of questions which are around funding. Um, one of our participants, he says that she has been, um, um, had the great pleasure of using the archive. It has helped her with research for a book. Um, she's donated items, she'd be interested to donate more items. Um, a thank you to Tony for all the work that you've put in over the years to 
add to the collection and to make it um, widely accessible to people. Um, and a question about, I suppose, about funding and what support is there for this? We, we value the, um, the, the heritage work that um, takes place, but what we, who are the funders that support heritage work? Somebody else has asked a similar question here about the relationship, if any, between the National Archives and their funding programmes. So it's interesting to think about that, isn't it? We, we recognise and value um, the importance of looking after um, history for the future and to preserve things. But of course, these um, activities take resources. And I know that there are, um, we're, we're the voluntary sector, um, our Irish in Britain and many charities under us, um, with a vast number of volunteers. But um, the, the act of collecting things and, and transporting things and collecting recordings um, can be done by volunteers, but it can also be done by through funded projects. So it'd be great to hear any um, suggestions of um, funders perhaps that organisations can tap into to support that work and also to understand how your um, collections at the um, Irish archives are, are safeguarded for the future. What's the um, funding is of course to do with um, securing isn't it for the future something rather than just for the present. Thanks Sibi. Um, yes yeah, some really good questions there about funding it's a very very complex topic and it's a sort of moving target I guess over the history of the time of the archive. We have had funding from various places um, and some funding has come directly from um, Irish community uh, sources. Other funding, obviously, from you know the university, uh, the university by housing the archive and staffing special collections is effectively supporting um, the project. Um, I guess in that respect, the move that I mentioned to um, to special collections in 2017 was significant because prior to that, the archive was part of a small research centre, which later. Um, you know, was was closed down. So the archive, I guess, made a good move in that sense, and that it was it's, it's much more secure as part of the university's special collections. Um, so the university obviously gets some funding for research, but very little comes through to the archive directly from those sources. Most funding uh, for research goes to academics and research projects. Um, and because we don't have an Irish studies program any longer, we are, we're not able to um, source that kind of funding so readily. Um, so we, we kind of fall between the stools in a way because, um, um, we're, because we're in a university, we're not necessarily seen as being kind of like a community group in the same way. Um, so it's been more difficult for us to apply for funding uh, from, for instance, the Immigrant Support Fund. Um, we did um, succeed in regards to the digitization project, which we're very grateful for, but we're not always able to quite so easily uh, apply for funding in the same way as a standalone Irish community organization might. Um, the question about the links with the National Archives is a very good one too. I did sit on a panel with the National Archives for a number of years um representing the irish in britain um, alongside other uh, minority ethnic groups um, but the national archives changed policy about five years ago and closed that committee down quite what the reasons are i'm not sure um but um you know i'm sure they still do um uh, outreach work if you could call it that um to other archives around britain um but um you know i think I, I would like to see more of that done again i would say personally because um it, the committee only survived about three years and it had some really good ideas but didn't it wasn't long enough for those uh, ideas to come to fruition before it was closed again um so i hope that answers some of the questions there on, on funding Thank you, thank you, Tenny. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more. Um, we have an important question about um, the collection, um, the, the Irish collection, and the um, way that things are categorised and the context of the collection. So the question is around um, the um, inclusion of material um, that might be categorised as LGBT. 
LGBTQI, so mm. um, relating to, to people who are um, lesbian, gay, and, and that mm. um, um, history as well. And I suppose the question is partly um, kind of recognising that perhaps, um, you know, there are different ways of organising and categorising material, aren't there? And mm. people often, um, people's material often fall, falls under different categories. So yeah. you might be Irish, for example, but you might be something else and something else. And how do you, um, yeah. how is the process for um, organizing and categorizing material so that it can be found easily by others? If your material fits into several possible collections, you might be a yeah. um who is also Irish, for example, so it could go into two collections, how can that material be kind of searched and browsed so that it would come up, for example, if you typed in mm. LGBTQI, what would you find within the Irish collection? Is Who, who is involved in the labelling of that? Is that the mm. curators or who, who gets to say what should be labelled? And of mm. course, historically, this is a really interesting question, isn't it? Because perhaps some labels which you know, labels over time, some labels go into the foreground, some go into the background. And so it's interesting to see mm. if you can use the labels that material has been. Yeah. Doing. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, if you go to um, archival conferences or seminars, archivists will spend hours and hours talking about, you know, this this kind of thing it is very important though. Um, I guess one of the uh, positives about digitization is it enables us to um, label things in multiple ways, um, simple tagging in the cataloging process. So a document may have an LGBTQ dimension and that can be included in the catalog record. It might not be necessarily obvious, you know, until that arch archival cataloger has gone through the document. But once they've noticed it, they can they can put that in. Um, um, the physical collection um, is, I should say, probably is is made up of two halves. There's the discrete collections by different organisations and different people who've donated their own personal papers. But then there's also a, kind of what we call the community collection, which is um, subject collection, organised by subject. Um, uh, so every aspect of Irish life in Britain, if you like, uh, under three broad categories of politics, welfare. Um, what's the other one? My mind's gone blank. blank. Welfare, politics and culture. Um, and within those three broad categories, a number of subcategories. So um, LGBTQ is included under uh, one of those categories uh, in culture, I think it is. So um, we've not that much. So I would encourage you know, um, people from the LD, LTQB um, community to to get in touch with us because um, I know it's much more active now than it was in the 80s. We've got some historical stuff in the 80s. It's quite interesting. Um, small groups from that time who we do have documentation on. Uh, so there's a historical dimension. But, um, you know, um, I would say that is one of the areas which we would like to encourage people to get in touch so by all means please thank you so that's an open invitation and a reminder about responsibilities for community organizations as well to proactively think about what um could be collected and donated as much as the the, the curators and the people involved yeah yeah to, because to be honest you know so again it's a resource or a funding issue um one of the things that when funding is limited you don't have the resources to do the outreach in the same way as you would like. So we're dependent on people to actually come to us. It's our responsibility to raise the awareness of the archive. But once we've done that, hopefully people will engage. Thank you, Tony. And just the last question, I think, before we will need to end the session, um, which has come in around um, um, the digital collections and computer literacy. So, of course, um, you've highlighted that the collections are now possible to be viewed in person, physically, mm. you can make an appointment and go along on a Tuesday to have a look. Mm. Um, with, um, of course, you've um, highlighted as well the um, progress with putting things into digital form so that they can be accessed by people 
um, from anywhere, from, from their homes, um, so making things accessible. Um, and um, the question is really around the support around um, access for older people. Of course, some older people have excellent um, digital literacy, digital skills and, and don't need that support, but there perhaps are others and younger people as well who perhaps find it harder to, to, um, to navigate sort of digital sites. Mm. So I suppose the question is around um, kind of access and inclusion um, using the digital formats for older people. Is there anywhere that you can signpost people to for support with that? Is there anybody, are there any volunteers connected with the archive who could mm. perhaps talk through people through how to, how to um, access mm. materials? Um, yeah. Um, that really was the question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and um... I might refer to Peter here. I'm not sure whether you might be able to help here. I know the university is very conscious of these issues around digital access. Mm. Um, and I know it has policies around its website and how the website is constructed. Um, would that be right, Peter? I don't know if, um... Yes. I mean, this is something that we're looking at and going through with regard to, say, for example, accessibility, one might call it generally, with re relatively new accessibility legislation coming on stream. Um, documentation, for example, that's um, publicised through the websites or uh, uploaded onto our websites has to meet certain criteria with regard to accessibility. For example, for those people with um, problems with vision, uh, that sort of thing, the sort of font one uses. But in terms, it's an interesting question and a very important one and thing, one I think we really have to include on our to-do list here with regard to those people who might need that additional support in that area. I have to be honest, it's not something that we do currently, but certainly something we should be doing to make the digital, particularly the digital uh, provision, uh, as widely available as possible. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. And perhaps that's an ongoing conversation for community organisations to consider. There are lots of creative ways. Absolutely. For volunteers perhaps to, to, to read out and record um, the kind of material that can be listened to so to, you know, to, to um, create different mm. mediums and help to yeah. um, make the collection more accessible. I so should say to Sibby also that I wouldn't like to get the impression that everything's gone digital you know we still do <laughs> run in-person visits and we're very much you know a physical archive as well so um, you know that's the two run alongside each other. Well, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all of our panellists and guests, um, and especially, of course, to Dr Tony Murray for joining us today, and to all of you who have joined in, tuned in today to our Thoughtful Thursday session. Um, as Ashling said at the beginning, this is a session that's been recorded, and mm -hmm. we'll be posting up the recording onto our Irish and Britain website, so please do um, feel free to listen again and also to share the link with people that you know in your communities and networks who may be interested. Um, and as we said, we are especially interested at Under Krivna to support family carers who may be looking for um, information, resources, materials that might help them to better understand the kinds of ex different experiences that Irish migrants, that people from Irish communities may have had in earlier life um, um, living in, in Britain um, in order to support reminiscence activities. And there is a great wealth of resources um, out there that you can um, browse physically or um, digitally within the archive that might support um, that kind of reminiscence activity. And I'd also like to, um, to um, add as well that if it's, this is your first Irish in Britain event, um, we're very open and welcoming to new members and to friends, associates of Irish in Britain. Feel free to have a look at our website and follow up on that if that is something that you're interested in. And also just a brief announcement that our next Thoughtful Thursday planned in the diary will be the 25th of November, a Thursday again, and we are going to be um, welcoming on that day three guest speakers um, who all have in different roles and in different ways been involved in the um, London buses, the, the transport um, professions um, as 
conductors, as drivers, as union activists. Um, and that should be a very interesting session, a reminiscence um, session really on the experiences of Irish migrant workers within London Transport, working particularly on buses. So that's just a plug and that information will be um, displayed and how to join on our, on our website. So thank you so much again, um, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.